Hey, my name's Nathan Valley. This is Theology for Teens, and we're doing something different today. If this is your first time watching, this is a great video. We're covering the first five of the 10 biggest objections that Gen Z has to Christianity. Now, as a youth pastor, Gen Z is who I prominently minister to. Maybe you're a Gen Z, or maybe you're an older person going, what is happening? Well, in this video, we're gonna be doing something important for each of those groups of people. So if you're a Gen Z, you can ask yourself this. Am I prepared to answer these objections when my friends tell me I'm crazy for being a Christian for these reasons? And if you're not a Gen Z, if you're an older person like me or like older than me, you can also ask, am I ready to witness to Gen Z in the real issues and concerns that they have about the Christian faith? And so as we watch this, I want you to be asking yourself that. How would I do if I was asked these questions by Gen Z people? So I haven't looked at these yet. This is off the cuff. We're gonna see how I do. The first of the 10 objections is lack of scientific evidence. Many Gen Z individuals view science as a reliable method for understanding the world and may object to Christianity due to a perceived lack of empirical evidence supporting its claims. Okay, this is actually a really deep and profound question. Is science a reliable way of understanding the world around us? Well, that is the mission of science, is to understand the world around us. And I would say that oftentimes science is a reliable way of seeing and understanding what we're seeing. But I don't see a lot of contradiction between what Scripture teaches and what science teaches, unless you presuppose that supernatural things are impossible. Science cannot account for supernatural claims because they are, by very definition, an exception to laws that are normally in play. When Jesus resurrected, something abnormal happened. And if you take a naturalistic view which says that is impossible, then you're in trouble because the resurrection is impossible. You can't really be a Christian anymore, at least not a real Christian. Now, when we ask, is there evidence for God's existence? This is the important question because if it's true, that it's more rational to believe that God is real than more rational to believe that he's not and somehow all of this other stuff is real without that. If it's more rational to believe God's real, then we have a bit of a different equation to examine and we can actually look at this with statistics. Based on the universe being in the state it's in now but God not existing, what are the probabilities for that? But then also, what are the probabilities that God is real and everything we are experiencing and witnessing is as a result of that? Now, if it's more likely that the latter is true and that God is indeed real, then it would mean that supernatural events are not inherently illogical because God can come about making supernatural events occur. So, is there a lack of scientific evidence if you assume naturalism? Now, I would also say there are certain Christian denominations that back themselves into a corner. They'll take something like the Reformation doctrine of total depravity and apply it to rationing skills. And so, in other words, man is not just deprived morally, they're not just culpable, but they are also logically deprived, which means they cannot come to a good conclusion unless they are justified by God and the Holy Spirit and effectually called by Him. This completely eliminates natural theology, and I think for people who have a strong scientific mind, they would have a hard, uh, a hard task of jumping into Calvinism or jumping into Lutheranism without just taking blind faith. Now, my particular understanding and, and breed of Christian faith isn't like this. When I engage with atheists, the very first thing I want to do is appeal to their normal thought processes, their normal rational thinking abilities, and I want to make a case for God's existence. Because if I can show them that there is a high probability of God existing, given various different factors, various different streams of scientific evidence, then I think we can get to the other things much more smoothly. So, is there a lack of scientific evidence? I actually don't think so, but I understand why many Gen Z individuals would think that, especially in the age we're growing up in, when there are so many different strands of Christianity, it's a weird way to say that, but so many different strands that just regard science as mockery um, and something that is completely invaluable. All right, let's look at number two, hypocrisy. Gen Z points out instances where religious leaders or followers have acted in ways that contradict Christian teachings, causing them to question the authenticity of the religion. I think this is actually a valid critique of Christianity, but I don't think it's something that actually would provide 
criticism on the views of Christianity. Let me explain. Jesus' dominant mission uh, in his teaching actually was critique of the religious hypocrisy of the day. We also see lots of critique of hypocrisy in the New Testament, but uh, also we see in the Old Testament that it's when the people turn away from God that they're actually given punishment and they're, they're given discipline from God. And so the clear, consistent message of Scripture is not that hypocrisy is okay. It's actually that God has an issue with hypocrisy. Now, are there Christians who are hypocritical and preach one thing out of one side of their mouth and then out of the other side say other things and act in different ways? Absolutely. And I find that so many Gen Z seekers actually are having this crisis not so much because of religious leaders, but because of their friends. The friends that they know that claim to be Christian are also the friends that they're seeing at parties hooking up with people. And so I think there's two elements of this. Just normal everyday believers have not done a good job of living consistently within their worldview, and that has tainted the witness of Christ to those people who have seen that. But in addition, religious leaders who are supposed to be the people who are perpetrating true Christianity oftentimes have fallen short. I know I've fallen short, but Christian leaders have fallen, fallen short in very public ways, in very backwards ways. I see news articles that pop across my feed all the time that talk about a different religious leader who was convicted of sexual assault of a minor who has been let off on probation or something like that rather than convicted with the full weight of the law. I think this is bad. I think hypocrisy is bad. So, if you object to Christianity because of hypocrisy, you need to know that you share a dominant objection that Christians have of Christians as well. Christians don't think hypocrisy is a good thing. In fact, we would say you need to take the log out of your own eye before trying to remove dust out of your opponent's eye or out of your um, neighbor's eye. Now. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't help get dust out of each other's eye. It means that we should make sure that we can see well that we don't have something bigger in our eye before we help bring our brothers and sisters to Christ. Second objection. I love that. Third one, the problem of evil. They often question how a loving and omnipotent God could allow so much suffering and evil in the world. Okay, so this problem of evil uh, atheists and a lot of Christians actually say this is the number one thing that people can appeal to with validity and can say, how do you answer this, Christians? And this is something that has generated a lot of conversation between Christians and atheists and people of all different worldviews. Anyone who holds to the fact that God is all-powerful and all-good have the issue of the problem of evil. And the logical argument goes like this, God is all-powerful. Two, God is all good. If God is all powerful, he could stop all evil. Four, if God is all good, he would want to stop all evil. And if all four of those things are true, we can logically conclude that God stops all evil. Now, when we look at the world around us, this doesn't seem to be the case. We can find instance after instance of, after instance where evil has just spread out. And we can look at natural evil. We can look at hurricanes and tornadoes. We can also look at moral evil, major events in our past, like the numerous dict dictatorial reigns in the 20th century that killed so many innocent people. And so we can look at these different portions of evil and we can ask God, where are you? And what people who argue against Christianity with the problem of evil are looking for is for Christians to either say, well, God's not truly all-powerful, and that would be jumping into some other version, a distortion of Christianity, or they're looking for Christians to say, well, God isn't ultimately all-good, or at the end of all of that, to just drop their Christianity altogether. So it's kind of an appeal to the uh, illogical nature of these two traits and what we experience around us. Now, the difficult thing is that addressing the problem of evil from my vantage point, and I'm not an expert in this, requires specificity um, for the different types of evil that we are addressing. And so, with a student, my response to the problem of evil is going to be, give me a specific example. And as we dig into that example, we could see a number of things. We could see that God isn't intervening for a greater good, for a greater purpose. Oftentimes we can see that God's intervention might bring about greater evil, especially when we're looking at how God could stop something as far as natural evil is concerned. God could have stopped the tornado, but what would that have entailed for God to have stopped that? 
Also, we can look at things like C.S. Lewis's arguments for the problem of evil, and we can look at the fact that God engineered the world in such a way where if someone takes a hammer and they hit someone in the head, it will do damage. Now, the free will defense for the problem of evil is, I think, the greatest defense. There are a number of Christian camps that hold to free will, even ones that don't say they do oftentimes, and so this is something that certainly could warrant more than just three or four minutes uh, in a small video like this. Maybe we'll do more on that later. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this channel because in the next video, we're going to be covering the last five of these 10, and so far they've been really interesting. All right, number four, exclusivity. Some Gen Z individuals are uncomfortable with the assertion that Christianity is the only path to salvation. Great, that's the question of religious pluralism. So let me unpack this a bit. Some people view all the different religions as being separate roads that lead to the same destination. In other words, you can get to heaven through Islam, you can get to heaven through Christianity, through Buddha, through whatever, Taoism, anything. You can pretty much get to heaven. You can get to eternal life or salvation. And the problem is that none of these religions, the people who really hold to these religions, will hold to religious pluralism. Islamic people believe they're the only ones going. Christians believe that it's only through belief in Jesus that you go to heaven. And you could look at the different ones, but Buddha, the enlightenment is a very specific path that involves certain core tenets. And if you're not holding to those, you are missing the mark. You are not saved. They wouldn't use that word. Um, so does anyone hold to religious pluralism that is actually religious? Well, we can see people who want to argue for religious pluralism that would say that they're Christian or another religion. But the question we would ask as Christians is, does this align with the actual teachings of Christ? And the answer is no, because Jesus actually says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, people will make arguments in the, the religious pluralism sectors and say that, well, when you get to God through Buddha, that is actually Jesus, the incarnation in Buddha. And here we start getting into weird territories where we have definitely stepped away from Christian teaching into a more modern invention. This is not something that was held for 1,800 years of the Christian church's teaching. So, is it true that Christianity is a religion of exclusivity? I would actually say no, despite the fact that we would say it's only through Jesus that you're saved. And here's why. Christianity is a wildly inclusive religion. Any type of person can come to the Father if they submit themselves to Jesus. If they're willing to go through the word and the truth, they can get to the Father. There is not one person that is cut off from that. Christianity is radically inclusive. It is the driver for the march against racism, the driver for the march against sexism in the United States, and Christianity is actually a very inclusive. Now, inclusive means something different than what the world means when it says inclusive. When the world says inclusive, it means that every different view is equally valid. Well, that is not what we mean in Christianity. By inclusive, we mean that every single person has the same right to the one truth, which is Jesus. So, we would have to redefine some words to get on the same page, me and a Gen Z person, but I found as I've engaged with Gen Z on this question, they can come to see, okay, yeah, Christianity is inclusive. I just need to kind of understand that word a little differently than most people do in culture today. Number five, we're gonna go out with a bang for this video. It's homophobia and transphobia. Many Christian denominations do not affirm LGBTQ plus identities, which can be a significant barrier for acceptance among Gen Z, who generally hold more progressive views on gender and sexuality. Okay, this is a huge question, a major topic of debate. In fact, I recently made a video where I just read an article commenting on Brian McLaren's views on, it, Brian McLaren was a guy who argued that we need to just not talk about this. And so this video was really intended for Christian people to think about, should I just not talk about this? Tons of hate on that video, lots of comments, very logical comments that were arguing for a pro LGBTQ plus position. Now, the question we have to ask ourselves here is as Christians, what would Christ desire for us? What does the teaching of scripture say? And that would actually implicate us because here's the thing, the one yes we say to Christ means a thousand no's. It's because we say yes to Christ one time 
that we say no to lots of other things. And so I might ask you, and this, this could be helpful, is there anything that's not okay to a Gen Z person? And I would ask them to give me something that's not okay. And uh, they might say murder, that's a, a really common one. And then I would say, why is that not okay? And then we'd get to hear their reasoning. And oftentimes for people who are questioning this, even if they say they're Christian, they're really getting their ethics from a humanistic perspective. In other words, it's my understanding of what's good and bad that is actually in correlation with what is really good and bad. So because murder seems like it hurts people, and I, I, I make all these different arguments, that means it's bad. And likewise, we see that there have been a lot of Christians who have hurt LGBTQ plus people. There have been a lot of Christians who stand on street, sign, street corners with signs, and it says that, that people are going to hell. And so the same humanism that can be such a good thing, like this conscience of what is right and wrong that God gave us, can be such a good thing, kind of gets hoodwinked on certain issues where there's a lot of cultural pressure and where Christians have really messed up in the past. And there's a number of these different topics. So the question is simply this, what does scripture teach? And we would have to genuinely study that because when we have something that is such a hot button topic like LGBTQ issues, it is going to be difficult for us to believe something that is contrary to what the culture is saying. Because frankly, for me to believe that being and acting on sexual, uh, homosexual desires is sinful, that is going to mean that I am scorned in society, in Western society today. Now, if I were to go to anywhere outside of Western society, I'm going to actually be in the majority on this view, but it's a bit of a rabbit trail. So is it true that Christians are homophobic and transphobic? Um, I have issues with those words. I'm not afraid of people who identify as homosexual or people who, uh, who have transitioned. I'm, I'm not afraid of those people, despite the fact that I think that God is the one who defines what is right and wrong, not me. And so because I view scripture saying that these things are not right, that is what makes me hold to this line. Now, at the same time, I can stand with you and say Christians have messed up so much in their treatment on these topics. Not only that, but churches have not done a good job of being an open place to discuss these issues, and they've really allowed Gen Z to formulate their views on morality on their own because of all the different things that have been regarded as taboo in religious circles and in churches. I don't want that. I want my youth ministry to be a place where people are free to ask questions as long as they're free and willing to hear answers. And I've found personally that in my youth ministries, despite the fact that I'm not affirming in the sense of saying, you know, you go girl on transitioning or on acting on homosexual desires, I have found that people who are genuinely seeking the truth and who struggle with same-sex attraction are very interested in the type of communities that I've fostered. And I think that's because there is a difference between people who have you know, decided that I am only going to answer every other question through the lens of LGBTQ issues. Are you pro or against that? Based on that, I'm going to determine whether you're good or bad, right or wrong. There's a huge difference between that and people who are actually seeking the truth. And people who are actually seeking the truth um, I, I just would want to invite them to a conversation about this, and we can examine different parts of Scripture if you're interested in that. But we're going to have to start with some previous questions on this. Do you think God is real? Because if not, what is your justification for morals, and why can you even say that I'm wrong for thinking those things are bad? Isn't that not inclusive? There's a lot of self-defeating premises within um, the, the, you know, the civil rights movement of the LGBTQ pressurization over the last 50 years. Okay, great. Those are the first five of the 10 biggest objections that Gen Z has to Christianity. How did you do? How would you do if you had a young person come up and ask you these questions? Comment down below, uh, put in the poll of this podcast what you would say, how you would do, would you say anything differently, would you engage differently? And also, don't forget, subscribe, because the next video, we're covering the final five of the biggest objections that Gen Z has to Christianity. Talk to you in that one. Bye.